when there's no absolute authority, who decides right and wrong? Who decides good and bad? Who decides what's good, what's evil? When you abandon the authority of the Word of God, ultimately anything goes, which is what's happened in the West. Well, good afternoon. Answers in Genesis is an apologetics ministry, which doesn't mean we apologize for our faith. It means we give an apologetic, which means to give a logical reason defense of the faith. We have many aspects to the Answers in Genesis ministry, all of our resources, books, DVDs, curricula, CDs, and also our speaking ministry, and there are many other aspects to Answers in Genesis, the website, social media, and so on. We also open two attractions. The two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world, the Ark Encounter, where we're at right now, and the brand new Answers Center, and then also the Creation Museum, which is 45 minutes away. The Creation Museum was opened in 2007, and the Ark Encounter was opened in 2016. We've had between six and a half to seven million people who've come through those facilities uh, since they opened. Well, why did we build the Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum? Why a ministry like Answers in Genesis? Well, I wanted to start off with two verses of Scripture, and we'll come back to these a little later on, because it really pertains to what's happening in our culture. In Genesis 26, 15, we read, Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. It's talking about Isaac, who found the Philistines had filled up the wells to stop the water from flowing. And then we read in Genesis 26, 18, and Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And just so you can be thinking in terms of what these verses mean pertaining to what I want to say, the water of the word of God flowed freely through this nation and, and the Western world. But the Philistines have been filling up the wells. Just a couple of days ago, we heard that that famous structure, Notre Dame in Paris, went up in flames. It was interesting, on Fox News, on the Tucker Carlson program, I saw this headline there, as you can see it, this caption, a sad reminder of Christianity's decline in Europe, question mark. And you know, when I saw that, I thought, you know, really, in a way, it's a picture of what's happening because a fire has ravaged across Europe and it's ravaging across the rest of the Western world. It's a fire that is causing lots of church buildings, in a sense, to be burned up because there are church buildings that have closed down all over Europe, all over the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, it's happening in America. Actually, what's happening is the wells are being filled in by the Philistines. Who would have thought that we would be talking about headlines like this in America? Children are being euthanized in Belgium. Uh, Ted Speaker says pedophilia is a natural sexual orientation. Pastor loses job after church sign stating homosexuality is still a sin causes an uproar. University bans Christian group for refusing leadership to gay student. Case hits federal court. How this polyamorous couple make their marriage work. Trans athletes make great gains, yet resentment still flares. Baby born to transgender man in landmark birth certificate case. Doctors warn dad they don't need parental consent to inject daughter 14 with male hormones. Target to install gender neutral bathrooms in all of its stores. Parents outraged after man who identifies as woman assaults 10 year old daughter in women's bathroom. Abortion activists, we should celebrate abortions like we celebrate babies with baby showers. Democrat Paddy Murray blocks Senate bill banning infanticide after failed abortions. Illinois billboard touts safe legal abortion in hit against Missouri's pro-life laws. And, and this one, to help gay son, 61-year-old woman gives birth to own grandchild. And in fact, here's the video that went with that. Creating UMA was truly a family affair. Matthew's mother would carry the baby. Elliot's sister donated the egg. 
and they use Matthew's sperm. You, can, you just look at that and you say, what a messed up world. And in fact, look at our whole Western world. We see moral relativism permeating the culture. I mean, terms we weren't talking about in terms of common terms a few years ago, now it's sort of everyday language. I mean, think about all the issues that we see before us, abortion and euthanasia and pedophilia and homosexual behavior and gender and gender and restrooms and LGBTQ and polyamory and polygamy and infanticide and transgender. Who would have thought we'd be talking about those as everyday terms? In fact, I believe you can describe our culture today in the whole Western world as that described in Judges 21-25. In those days, there was no king. There was no absolute authority. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes. You see, when there's no absolute authority, who decides right and wrong? Who decides good and bad? Who decides what's good, what's evil? When you abandon the authority of the word of God, ultimately anything goes, which is what's happened in the West. And then our younger generation, Generation Z, George Varner has done research in Generation Z. They're the youngest generation uh, that are there today up to about, you know, the, the teenage years and so on, a little bit into the, the 20s. What George Varner found was this. Teens 13 to 18 years old are twice as likely as adults to say they're atheist. In fact, in 2018, the research Varner did, he made this statement. It may come as no surprise that the influence of Christianity in the United States is waning. Rates of church attendance, religious affiliation, belief in God, prayer and Bible reading have been dropping for decades. Americans' belief are becoming more post-Christian and concurrently, religious identity is changing. Enter G Generation Z. Born between 1999 and 2015, they are the first truly post-Christian generation. We're living in an increasingly post-Christian culture. The National Opinion Research Center, University of Chicago, just released some interesting data. And you can see here where they did some work on the percent of population that is Christian, however they define that term, and in brackets it says Protestant. But you'll notice with the younger generations, you'll notice how it's dropping markedly. And you see this here. We've actually magnified that for emphasis. And then when you look here at the percent of population that say they have no religion, well, there's no such thing as no religion. Everyone has a religion. Everyone has beliefs about who they are and where they came from. What they mean is they're basically atheistic, uh, agnostic, atheistic, same sort of thing. But notice with the younger generations how rapidly that's rising. What's going to happen when they become the dominant group in this culture? And in fact, there, there's an incredible war right now you see between the older, more Christianized generations and the younger, much more secularized generations. And that's why we're seeing uh, such problems in our culture. But why? Why has this occurred? Why, why did this happen? Well, I also want to say this. I believe it reflects the state of the church. Because when we look at the culture and we say, look how bad the culture is, I believe what we should be saying is, well, what's happened with the church? Because really, the culture is a reflection of the church. And what has happened in the church? Well, we published a book. Back in 2009, we did re research with America's Research Group based on research George Varner had done where he found two-thirds of young people were leaving the church in America by the time they reached college age with very few returning. And we had our researchers find those that had left the church and ask them, why did you leave? And over and over again, the answers related to what they were taught at school, science, evolution, not getting answers to questions about how can you believe in a God of love with death and suffering and so on, it really came down to the fact they weren't taught apologetics, they weren't taught to be able to answer the skeptical questions of this age, and much of the church told them, you can believe what you're taught at school about evolution, millions of years, that doesn't matter, just trust in Jesus. We also did the research on those that hadn't left the church are still in the church. Two-thirds of young people have walked away from the church. What about those that are left in the church? And we published it in a book called Ready to Return because they need to return to the authority of the Word of God. But think about this. The younger generations, the millennials, Generation Z in our churches, do you consider yourself born again? 40% outright said no. 
Do you believe if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven? 65% say yes. If 65% believe if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven, then that 40% figure is far too low. Should gay couples be allowed to marry? 40% say yes, 10% don't know. Over 50% would not stand against gay marriage. And they're the ones that are left in the church. In 2015, we did research to find out how many people would come to the life-size ark when we opened it. But we also had the researchers ask questions about the spiritual state of the nation. And one of the questions they asked, this is general population study, so it's not singling out particular groups or whether they're Christian or not Christian, just general population study. If you went to church regularly as kids, the question was uh, asked, Do you still attend most Sundays or did you stop attending? And you'll notice something here, that in the 60s generation, those that went to church, 22% have stopped attending. But look at the 20s generation, it's 53%. That's the change that's occurring in the culture. And it's really substantiating what was said by the Pew Research Center in 2010 when they did research on attendance at religious services by generation in America, the sense saying they attend several times a week, every week, or nearly every week, notice something. The greatest generation born before 1928, 56% went to church. The silent generation, 1928 to 45, and they were born 44%. The baby boomers, I'm in the baby boomer generation, 46 to 64, 32%. Generation X, 65 to 80, when they were born, 27%, the millennials, it's only 18%, and Generation Z are less than that. That is the future of America, but it's already happened in much of the rest of the Western world, if you want to look at Europe, if you want to look at the United Kingdom. What you see there is what's happening right now before our very eyes. And then look at the changing world views. Views of homosexuality by generation, percent saying same-sex relations are always wrong, With the greatest generation, 78% said that. The silent, it was 70. The baby boom is 56. Now you get below 50%. Generation X, 47%. The millennials, 43%. You want to know where Generation Z are at? Well, what Barna found in the 2018 research is this. Generation Z, our youngest generation today, are twice as likely to be atheist as any previous generation. Wow. Well, what happened? Actually, the Bible tells us. It warns us. In Genesis 2, God said to Adam, the first man, and it was a test of obedience to obey God's word, you can eat of all the trees. There's one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely die. Adam, obey God's word. But then the devil, in the form of a serpent, came to Eve and and said, did God actually say? Did he really say? Notice something, the first attack was on the authority of the word of God. You don't have to believe God's word. And you will be like God. You can be your own God. You decide truth for yourself. No, it's not God's word. Man determines truth. And what happened there was the beginning of a battle. It's a battle between two religions a battle between God's word and man's word, and that is the same battle that is going on today. The battle has not changed. Be warned. The battle has not changed. Understand the times. The battle has not changed, but it manifests itself in different ways, in different eras. You see, if your foundation is God's word, You know what we really need to understand? What does it mean that the Bible is God's word? Do do, do you know what this book claims over 3,000 times to be the word of God? The word of God who knows everything there is to know about everything. It says, in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God is not a man that he should lie. All scripture is inspired. God breathed. If this really is what it says it is, it is the word of the one who knows all things By the way, compared to what God knows, we know next door to nothing. And the only way we could have the ability to come to the right conclusions about anything and to have the right way of thinking about this world is to start from God's word to build our worldview. 
And if you don't start there, there's only one other foundation, and that is man's word and builds a whole different worldview. And when you mix man's word in with God's word, as much of the church has done, as I want to show you, and taken man's views of, of, of origins and so on and added it into the Bible, then your starting point is no longer God's word because once you've added fallible man's ideas into the infallible word, your starting point is fallible. So it's man's word. See, let me explain it like this. Would you ever build a house by building the roof first? And then the walls, and then the foundation. We live in Kentucky, and I've got news for you. We don't build houses like that. Do you know how they build houses in the state of Kentucky? Like they do in all the other states in America and around the world. You actually build the foundation first, and then you build the walls, and then you build the roof. I want us to grasp hold of what's really been going on in our churches, in our homes, that's now reflected in the state of the culture. And you see, what I want to show you, I want to go through and illustrate, is that much of the church told generations, you don't be, need to believe God's word in Genesis. You can believe in evolution millions of years. It doesn't matter if they're ordinary days. And look, as long as you trust in Jesus. You know what we did by that? We said, we're going to concentrate on the roof and the walls. And then the majority of the 90, 95% of kids from church homes go to the public, the government education system, where by and large they've thrown God out, the Bible out, prayer out. They say you can explain the whole of life by natural processes. Naturalism is atheism. And we said, you can believe that. That's okay. That doesn't matter. Don't need to believe Genesis. We'll send you to a Christian college and seminary that, that'll tell you that that's okay. That's all right. You can do that as long as you trust in Jesus. And you know what we did? We said, you can have the foundation that man gives, but we want you to have the roof and the walls that we're giving you. But the coming generations have become much more consistent, and they realize the roof and the walls of Christianity won't stand on that foundation of the world, and they build a different structure in accord with that foundation. You see, when you start with God's word, you build a world view based on God's word. When you start with man's word, it's a whole different world view. And what's happening is we see the Christian world view collapsing before our very eyes all across the Western world because we have told generations, you don't need to have the foundation of God's word. Oh, it's an interesting book of spiritual things and moral things and relationships that you can sort of add to your thinking. And it's sort of over here somewhere. And most of our churches today, most of our pastors and Christian leaders concentrate on preaching on the spiritual and moral things and relationships and so on. And telling generations the history in Genesis is not true or you don't need to believe it doesn't matter. And now we wonder why we see generations that have walked away from the church and are becoming consistent and saying, if the Bible's not the absolute authority, I can do what is right in my own eyes and ultimately anything goes. And that's what we're seeing. And as we look at that, as we look at that, we can say, but how did this happen? You know, if we'd have read 2 Corinthians 11, 3, God has a warning for us. And I say, God, you know, one of the things I've noticed, uh, doing research for this particular presentation, as I was looking at videos of Christian academics and seminary professors and Bible college professors, and I, I, I tell you what got to me after a while. Well, the author here was struggling with this, and the author here didn't know how to say this, and, and, and the author here, he put it this way, but it doesn't really mean that, it means this, and the author here, and, and, and you know what I realized? Really what's going on is we have whole generations that don't understand this is not the word of, of, of men. This is in truth, as Paul says in Thessalonians, this is in truth the word of God. God is the author. And he wasn't struggling with the words. He moved people by his spirit to write what he wanted for us. And it will stand forever. That's what the scripture says. Paul says this, but it's God through Paul. In fact, I'm that way now because of what's happening in our churches. I'm almost reticent to say, Paul says, Peter says, 
I really want to emphasize God through Paul says to make the point, this is God's word. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3, but I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Do you know what we're being warned here? I want to warn you, the devil's going to use the same method on you, on your kids, on your grandkids, on your neighbors, on your friends. He's going to use the same method on you as he did on Eve to get you to a position of not believing the things of God. Wow, if he's going to use the same method he used on Eve, we better go back and find out the method he used on Eve. And what was that method? Did God really say? In other words, warning, 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 the attack is going to be on the authority of the word. That's where the attack is going to be, on the authority of the word. I call it the Genesis 3 attack. And you know, the Genesis 3 attack has not changed since the garden but it manifests itself in different ways at different times. And we need to be people who understand the times like the men of Ishakar and understand the Genesis 3 attack of our age. You see, when Peter and Paul preached the gospel, did anyone come up to them and say, it's all very well to preach about Jesus and the resurrection, but what about carbon dating? Well, carbon dating is a 20th century invention. They didn't deal with that issue. When Martin Luther nailed those theses on the door of the church in 1517, do you think anyone came to him and said, that's all very well and good, but I want to know, were dinosaurs on the ark? Well, the word dinosaur wasn't even invented until 1841. My point is, people at past times in different eras had to deal with all sorts of attacks on the authority of the word, whether it was the resurrection, the deity of Christ, whether it was justification by faith, whatever, whatever it was, modal is, all sorts of issues. But here's my question. What is the Genesis 3 attack today? What is the Genesis 3 attack of the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries in particular? And I want to suggest to you that the teaching of evolution Molecules to man, evolution, ape-like creatures to people, big bang, supposedly billions of years ago, the millions of years for the age of the universe, earth, millions and millions of years, and all of that is the Genesis 3 attack that, attack that has devastated the church and culture. The majority of our Christian leaders have said you can believe in millions of years and add it to the Bible increasingly we have Christian leaders in our seminaries and Bible colleges saying you don't need to believe in a real Adam and Eve, a literal Adam and Eve. Noah's flood wasn't a global flood. See, I want to explain to you what has really happened. I want you to understand this. Look, people often say to us, oh, you people are on about the young earth. Young earth not, is not the issue. Believing in a young earth is really a consequence of what we believe about Scripture. I want you to understand that the ministry of Answers in Genesis, the Ark Encounter, the Christian Museum, our ministry is one dealing with biblical authority and the gospel message. And, and I really have a burden to help people understand, look, you've, you've got to stand back and look at what's happened. The authority of the word has come under attack. When you open that door and say, you don't need to believe this as written, and you can take man's ideas and add it to the scripture and reinterpret the scripture, you have unlocked a door that future generations will push open further and further, and they'll abandon the word of God. And it really started back in the 18th, 19th centuries when atheists and deists, people who didn't believe in the God of creation, who wanted to explain everything by natural processes, said all those fossils were laid down over millions of years. Many church leaders at that time said, oh, well, we can accept the millions of years and we'll fit them into Genesis. We'll put them in a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. Or we'll put them before verse 1 or in verse 1. Or we'll reinterpret the days of creation you'll find one of those sorts of positions in most churches, most Bible colleges and seminaries today. And then Darwin popularized these ideas of evolution and ape-like creatures to people, and many church leaders said, oh, we can say God used evolution. So you start to see these ideas arising in the church, theistic evolution, day-age, gap theory, 
So Fred Hoyle coins the term Big Bang. Oh, we can believe in the Big Bang. We'll say God did it. In the beginning, God created. That's the Big Bang. <laughs> of course, if you understood the Big Bang, number one is to explain things by natural processes, not supernatural. And number two, the order of events doesn't fit with Genesis. Because the Big Bang has the stars and then the sun and then the earth is a hot mountain blob. The Bible has the earth covered with water and the sun, moon and stars on day four. And so we start to see arising in the church all of these different compromised positions. And by the way, whether it's the gap theory, day age, theistic evolution, day gap day, framework of hypothesis, progressive creation, Adam is a metaphor for Israel, cosmic temple inauguration view, humans from animals with amnesia. I mean, these are all views you find in the church. They have one thing in common. Every one of them has one thing in common, trying to fit the millions of years into the Bible. I've gone to churches where they've said, oh, we believe in the gap theory here. Oh, we have a pastor that believes in day age. Oh, we have some of our elders believe in theistic evolution and so on. And they say to me, what's your view? And I say, oh, the biblical one. <laughs> I, I just take what it says in the Bible as written, just like Jesus did, just like Paul, Peter, I mean the New Testament, I mean, just, just like we read there. You know, it's interesting, when we did the research for the Ready to Return book, those millennials, basically, that didn't leave the church, that were still left in the church, they were asked a question. If you don't believe the Bible is true and historically accurate, what made you begin to doubt the Bible? And notice, the age of the earth is a massive issue. Written by men is a massive issue. Bible has errors, even down to evolution. And that doubt leads to unbelief. And now we see the younger generations that have walked away from the church. And we see the changing worldview from a more Christianized worldview to a secular worldview. Because you see, the battle has been an authority issue. We have raised up generations and told them you can take man's ideas about evolution of millions of years and change God's word in Genesis. Why shouldn't they take man's ideas about marriage and reinterpret the Bible? I was on a radio program once and I had a minister who said to me, now wait a minute, wait a minute, you know we can have different views of eschatology, pre-mill, post-mill, a-mill, treadmill, windmill, there's all sorts of different views of eschatology and I said that's true. And there's different views of modes of baptism, sprinkling, immersion and different views of speaking in tongues and Sabbath day and I said yes. Well we have that in the church and we have different views of Genesis, same thing. No, it is not the same thing. I, I want you to grasp hold of this. You think about it. When you're arguing about an eschatological view, modes of baptism, tongues, Sabbath day, and so on, primarily people are, are arguing from Scripture and, and taking it in the context it's written and so on, and that's, that's where, the, where the arguments really are. But when people argue about different views of Genesis, it's because, but the scientists say billions of years. But scientists are saying evolution. So you've got to take what they say and you've got to add that to the Bible. And that's the key to understand why this issue of creation evolution, the age of the earth, is so important. Because it is the Genesis 3 attack of today to undermine the authority of Scripture from the very first verse. See, let me, let me explain to you here. If we built our thinking on God's Word... If we just start with God's word, get rid of all outside influences, let's just start with God's word, and we begin in Genesis, says, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, God created in six days, and rested on the seventh day. Rested, we're not still in the seventh day. He rested and blessed the Sabbath day. That's helping us understand there, there were six days and one day is seven days. It's the basis for our week. Now, most of our Christian colleges, seminaries, Bible colleges, professors, academics, and majority of our pastors, we've done the research on this, and we've got a book out there called Already Compromised that deals with this too, some of the research we did. But the majority of our Christian leaders would say, well, they're not ordinary days. In fact, I find most people in the church will tell me, well, we don't know what the days of creation were. 
Well, the Hebrew word for day, the word yom, what does it mean? Because there are people that will tell me, but it can mean something other than ordinary day. And you know what I say to them? I had a pastor once say to me, but it can mean something other than ordinary day. And I said, yeah, that's true. But you know what? What? It can also mean an ordinary day. <laughs> you see, most words have two or more meanings dependent upon context. I could say to you, there's somebody here who is at the back of the auditorium and they've got a sore back and they came back after being here uh, before and they sat in a chair with their back against the back of the chair. Now, you understood the different meanings of the word back, correct? Yeah, because context determines meaning. You know, in English, the word day has different meanings. The word day, uh, for instance, back in my father's day, that means time. It took 10 days, well, you would interpret that as 10 24-hour days, to drive across the Australian outback during the day, that means the daylight portion of a day. There's the word day with three different meanings, and we understand that according to context. The Hebrew word for day, the word yom, has that, that sort of range of meaning. For instance, in Isaiah, Isaiah, depends what country I'm in, the day of the Lord is near. It's not talking about a 24-hour day. It's talking about the time of the Lord, the day of the captivity of the land in Judges, time. In Genesis 2-4, it's interesting, the number of professors at seminaries and colleges I looked at on the internet to get some quotes for this particular presentation, no, it's say, how can the word day mean an ordinary day in Genesis 1, when in Genesis 2, 4, it says in the day that God created, and that's not referring to a specific day. No, it's not, because in context, and I want to show you, in context, Genesis 2, 4 means time, and it's written differently to the days in Genesis 1. Here's the interesting thing. The Hebrew word for day, yom, in the singular or plural form, is used 2,301 times in the Old Testament, and we know what it means everywhere it's used except Genesis chapter 1. You think about this for a moment. Do you ever hear anyone saying, well, we don't know what the days of creation were, you know? But for instance, we, we don't know how long Joshua took to march around Jericho. Was it a day? Was it a million years? We don't know what the word day means. <laughs> of course we know what it means, because in context we know what it means. People, if you took away Genesis 1, we would tell you we know what the word day means everywhere it's used in Scripture, in the Old Testament. But Genesis 1, oh, it's a problem. We don't know. Why, why is Genesis 1 the problem? And I'll tell you why. Because if you're going to try to fit millions of years in the Bible, you've got to have it before Adam because the secularists say the millions of years came before man. And so if you take that and try to fit it in there, you've got to do something with the days of creation. So question, when does the word yom mean an ordinary day? Well, here's a fairly modern Hebrew dictionary, lexicon, Kola Baumgartner, and it has a listing of all the meanings for the word yom in context. But notice, number two, day of 24 hours. When does it mean 24 hours? You notice what it does? It actually lists, it actually lists Genesis 1-5 as the first example. And you know why? Because... Outside of Genesis 1, if you just get rid of Genesis 1, when the word day is used with a number 410 times, it means an ordinary day every time. When you have the phrase evening and morning by itself, outside of Genesis 1, 38 times always means an ordinary day. When you have the word evening with the word day or the word morning with the word day, 23 times each, in fact, outside of Genesis 1, means an ordinary day. When you have the word night with the word day, 52 times means an ordinary day. Well, that's when day means an ordinary day. But because most of our people in our churches and Christian leaders don't believe Genesis 1 is talking about ordinary days, it must be real difficult to figure it out. So let's see how difficult it is. Day 1, night, evening, morning, number, day. Day 2, evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. Evening, mo you know, I'm getting a really strong hint about something. <laughs> Do you know what I think God was doing? Because, see, you don't even need evening and morning and number and night. You just need a number with the word day or the phrase evening and morning, or just evening with day. But you know what I think God was doing? I think, I think he was saying, these people in the 21st century are going to be so thick that I'm going to qualify this over and over and over again so they can't get it wrong and they still get it wrong. You know why? Because we would rather believe the words of men than the word of God. And that's our problem. And you know what? That reflects our sin nature. Because you know what our sin nature is? 
go back to Adam and Eve, we succumbed to the devil. Did God really say? So we are prone to question the word of God. We, we have to be on guard against that because that's our nature. Exodus 20 verse 11 tells us why we have a seven-day week because God created everything in six days and rested for one. He didn't create everything in six million years and rest for a million years. And if those days are ordinary days, which they are, and we know that the Bible records Adam was made on day six, and then Adam had a son called Seth when he was 130 years old, and we can go through there. Seth fathered Enosh at 105, and Enosh fathered Kenan at 90, and Kenan fathered, I don't know how to pronounce this, Mahalalel or something, at 70, and then he fathered Jared at 65, and Jared fathered Enoch at 162, and Enoch fathered Methuselah at 65, and you go through all those, and you come to the time of, of Abraham and Christ and present, and it adds up to about 6,000 years. So if you just take God's word as written, no outside influences as written, you would come to the conclusion, you know what, I, the earth and the universe are only about 6,000 years old. Oh, you'll be mocked at, you'll be scoffed at, you'll be called anti-science, anti-academic, anti-intellectual, not just by the secular world, but by most of the church. Why? You can't take God's word as written like that. You've got to take man's word and add it to the Bible. You see, the majority in our church and Christian colleges believe in millions of years. A lot of them reject a global flood, reject a literal Adam and Eve. And they have all these particular compromised positions that you see now rife in the Christian world. Tell me, has the compromise worked? Stand back and look. Is the church impacting the culture like it used to? You'd think some of these people would ask themselves, wait a minute, there must be something fundamentally wrong. We're not impacting the culture like we used to. You know why? Because they let the culture impact the church. And I believe a lot of it has to do with academic pride and peer pressure, and wanting to conform to the world because men love darkness rather than light. Our nature is we would rather the darkness. We've got to be on guard about our sin nature. What is it we inherited from, from Adam? Go back there. What happened? Did God really say we succumb to you can be your own God? Each one of us has a problem. We want to be our own God. That's our nature. You need to be on guard when you're looking at God's word and saying, am I really reading what it says or am I adding something into scripture? You know, recently, well, actually this was in 2014, World Magazine published an article about a group called BioLogos, the BioLogos Foundation. And it said this, the BioLogos Foundation is making a major well-funded push because a lot of their funding comes from the John Templeton Foundation, and John Templeton was extremely liberal, and they've got millions and millions of dollars. A well-funded push to change the way Christians read Genesis and think about Adam and Eve. And, this, and BioLogos is infiltrating our Christian colleges and seminaries. They, they, they use names like, we want to provide you with the money to have a science for seminary series. Oh, that sounds good. But the underlying agenda is to get them to believe in millions of years in evolution. If you read the BioLogos website about them, it says, our mission invites the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith as we presented an evolutionary understanding of God's creation. What we believe, we believe that the diversity and interrelation of all life on earth are best explained by the God-ordained process of evolution with common descent. Thus, evolution is not in opposition to God, but a means by which God providentially achieves his purposes. Now, I want to give you a particular example. I'll give you a couple, actually, but one main one of how this is affecting our colleges and many unsuspecting parents uh, paying thousands and thousands of dollars to Christian colleges to send their kids there to have their foundation in God's word totally undermined. So I'm going to start with a really well-known college, Wheaton College in Illinois. Wheaton claims this on their website. As the top distinctively Christian liberal arts college in the US, Wheaton College ranks among the best liberal arts colleges in the nation. 
Well, I know that a lot of professors at Wheaton teach millions of years and evolution, and even much more than that, as you'll see. Recently, Christian Post, in April 2019, had an article that Wheaton scholars pen first Origins College textbook, Bridging the Bible to Mainline Science. As soon as I see that, Bridging the Bible to Mainline Science, oh, big red flag. In fact, one million red flags. And we read about what they did, and they want this textbook used in colleges all across the nation. You know who funded that textbook? BioLogos. So in the BioLogos, which means ultimately it goes back to the John Templeton Foundation and others that give to BioLogos, a number of people in Grand Rapids do that, get, get, donate to them. Five Wheaton College professors released new book on theories of origins. And here's what it said in the BioLogos website. At BioLogos, we're thrilled to announce the release of an important new book, Understanding Scientific Theories of Origins, Cosmology, Geology, and Biology in a Christian Perspective. This book, a textbook, was written by five Wheaton College professors, the fruit of a three-year grant they received from BioLogos. And this is the textbook. I had, <laughs> I had one of our staff, I gave him a job <laughs> on Monday, read the entire book. And he did. I read part of it, but he read the whole lot. One of the authors who's most influential in the book is John Walton. And if you've heard of his book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, he has another one out dealing with the flood because he doesn't believe in a global flood. But he was at Moody for 20 years. And he's professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College, and his ideas permeate the textbook. From the BioLogos website, let's listen to John Walton himself. In my book, I've tried to show that the, uh, the account in Genesis 1 is not intended to be an account of material origins. If that's so, the Bible has no narrative of material origins. And if that's so, then we don't have to defend the Bible's narrative of material origins against a, a scientific narrative, because the Bible doesn't offer one. In that case, we can say, well, if the Bible doesn't offer us a narrative, we can look to science for the narrative. What they mean by science is evolution, millions of years, Big Bang, and so on. And if there's no material account of creation, then we have no idea how we got here. See, in that textbook, let me give you some actual quotes from the textbook. A Bible-first approach, they should have added in brackets, like Answers in Genesis. A Bible-first approach devalues the meaningfulness of creation revelation. See, they say, oh, but there's two revelations. You've got the Bible and you've got the revelation of nature. I've got news for you. Nature is cursed. And what they mean by the revelation of nature is their interpretation of how everything got here, which is their beliefs about the past, which is totally evolutionary, based on naturalism, atheism. Actually, what I would say, do you know what this textbook is doing? Helping the atheists convince generations of kids not to believe the Bible. That's right. Look, let's be honest. That's what it is. It does not treat creation as revelatory for informing our thinking about creation. Here's an example of what they believe creation informs us to think. When Christians deny the universe's witness that is about 13.8 billion years old, by proposing a particular age for creation, drive from a particular interpretation of Genesis. Oh, we interpret Genesis, but they don't interpret nature. Nature, you go out there, you'll see it. It's hanging on rocks. It says, hi, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. And you go to Scripture, and oh, the, these people interpret Scripture because it says six days and gives you the ages when they were born, and you can add them all up. Corroborating the observations and conclusions of modern astronomers, geologists find evidence for an ancient creation extending billions of years back in time. The age of the Earth, now understood to be 4.55 billion years, is really less than a theory than it is a measurement. It's an actual measurement. You can go out there and do it. So what do they do with the issue of, if you believe in the millions of years and all those fossils before man, there's not just death, but there's disease in the fossil record, and. There's horrible things in the fossil record. The Bible says man's sin led to death. And Romans 8 says the whole creation groans in pain because of sin. 
When God designates something as good, he is saying that it is ready to function as he intended. It does not mean that creation is perfect. Never messy or even everywhere safe. Do not get too close to a lava flow. Wait a minute, lava flows happen in the present. And there would have been no lava flows originally because the Bible says God created the earth covered with water. Although some Christians have argued that the fall utterly disrupted some kind of original perfection of creation, there is no evidence from either the Bible or the creation making that foregone conclusion. How about the whole creation groans? Oh, yeah, it always has done. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's how God, yeah. What about the flood, the global flood? In the textbook, here it is enough to say that geological data to support a flood of massive proportion is lacking. Furthermore, there's no archaeological evidence that lends support to such a flood. Yeah, there's none. I mean, all you find all over the earth are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. That's all you find. There's no evidence of global flood. Oh, what about the Bible's account that we're all descended of one man and one woman? 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul says, 15.45, Adam was the first man. Genesis 3, 20, Eve was the mother of all living. Textbook. Surveyed as a whole, it seems that the theory of evolution not only is consistent with the comprehensive doctrine of creation, but also possibly exemplifies many of its features of evolution. Which means they must believe man came from ape-like creatures. Do they believe that? Well, let's see what they say. Humans are hominoid primates. Do you know what that means? Look it up. Apes. We have a room full of apes. You are in the ape family. In the hominin tribe, you happen to be a hominin tribe within the ape family, and you know what's different about you? Evidenced by our ever-advancing technology, cultural innovations, and adaptability to different environments, you just happen to be more intelligent than other apes. Wow. How about you're different because you're made in the image of God? Therefore, being formed from dust is not about material origins, Adam's or ours. Adam wasn't formed from dust. That means Eve wasn't made from his side. You know, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, do you know what we read? Woman came from man. Oh, no, that's not true. From dust you come, and to dust you will return when you die. It wasn't real dust. This forming account, then, is archetypal and more about the identity of all of us than about describing the material origins of the first humans. It's all archetypal. It's a story to teach history, but it's not the history that it states. It's a different history. It's... What a mess. No wonder they're walking away from the church. Oh, what about this one? Many people have heard of William Lane Craig. He's said to be a great apologist today. He's a research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology, associated with Viola. He says young earth creationism is an embarrassment. Let's hear a quote from him. How old is the world? The best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now, this is good, you see. I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's 6,500 years old. Um, you, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, mm. the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science okay. in presenting these arguments. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics uh, supports. I'm going with the flow of what the secularists are saying. What about a conservative seminary, like Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, that's basically been associated with the PCA uh, in America, Dr. John Collins, professor of Old Testament there. What's your perspective on the flood? Do you think it was global or local? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think from the perspective of the words in Genesis uh, 6 through 9, you can't tell. Um, the, the, uh, the, it, I mean, uh, at first reading, it looks like it was global, doesn't it? Because it's all the earth and the high mountains are covered and so forth. Yeah, the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubit deeps. It was obviously a local flood. 
He goes on to say, but the word earth can mean something other than the whole earth and so on. But take the whole context of, of Genesis 7. Well, then he's asked, did all people except those on the ark die during the flood? Now, this is a real important issue because this gets to the crux of the matter. Okay. And do you think that the flood was universal or um, in terms of wiping out all of humanity or, or not? Um, I, I, I would like to think so. Um, it's, there, there's places where you get a little bit uncertain. Um, how long ago uh, did it take place Be becomes a, a question. Uh, and I don't, think, I don't think there's any answer to that. Um, but um, you, you do find hints in some uh, uh, ancient expositors the, uh, of the possibility that others besides Noah and his family survived the flood. Uh, Josephus, for example, talks about that. Uh, and Josephus is a Jewish writer in the towards the end of the first century. Do, do I read anywhere all Josephus' words are God-breathed? So in other words, when asked the question, and this is the crux of the issue that's happening in our church, this is what's happened, this is reflected in the culture, did all humanity uh, get wiped out except those on the ark where there's others that survived? Well, I'm, you know, I'd like to think they all got wiped out except those on the ark. But we've got these other writers. In other words, these things outside of Scripture. Do you know what my answer would be? Well, let's read Scripture. Let's read God's Word. All flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swimming creatures that swarm on the earth, all mankind except the eight on the ark. What about 1 Peter 3.20? Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Of course, it's a local flood. It was only the eight in that area. Because it was only mankind in that area. They'll justify anything they want. The Genesis 3 attack. And again, when you look at the research we did for Ready to Return, which of these makes you question the Bible the most? Notice in the younger generations, the age of the earth is the major issue. And now we see them walk away from the church. Now we're seeing Generation Z twice as atheist as any previous generation. You know, I started talking about wells and water. Water is used to symbolize a number of things in Scripture, but it's used to symbolize the Word of God. The washing of the water with the Word in Ephesians 5.26. See, I would say to you, it used to be that there were wells that burst forth with the living water, the water of the Word of God, that proclaimed the authority of God's Word and the gospel all across this nation, all across our Western world. But the Philistines and many of those who are church leaders who listen to the Philistines have stopped and filled with earth all the wells that were previously dug. And those wells are being filled up. You know, Jeremiah talks about, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. All the way through Scripture, it starts the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is really the tree of death. God's word, man's word, light, darkness, build your house on the rock, build your house on the sand. For Christ, against, those who gather, those who scatter. The fountain of living waters, the broken cistern of man. There's been this battle ever since the beginning. It's the same battle today. But you know what? The church has let the broken systems of man start to take over. And now we're not seeing the water of the word proclaimed as much because now man's word as the foundation. People are building their house on the sand and the Philistines and the, and the church let them fill up the wells. And we're seeing moral relativism pervading the culture. And Genesis tells us that when Isaac saw that the wells were filled, he dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham and gave them the names that his father had given them. He dug again the wells so the water would flow. Oh, 
Friends, we need to dig again the wells of the fathers so we can see the water of the word spread across the nation and the world. How we need to do that. Because we have generations today that are in this tornado and all that's going on around them, generations brought up in the church. What do we do with gay marriage, with, with, with abortion? What do we do with euthanasia? What do we do with all these issues? How do we understand these? What do we do? And they're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And I believe the Lord has raised up ministries like Answers in Genesis, the Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum, to embolden people to dig again the wells. I want you to go out from this place and be a well digger. You know where you've got to start, by the way? In the church. And, and I, I want to just use the last few minutes. <laughs> that makes you think we're getting near the end. <laughs> Take that symbolically. <laughs> I want to use the last few minutes... To, to give you some practical understanding here of what we need to be doing, just a little bit, just a glimpse. Two verses of Scripture. 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense or an answer from the Greek word apologia. We need to be teaching apologetics in our homes, in our churches, in our Christian colleges, and, and, and our institutions. We need to be raising up generations who understand how to answer the attacks of this age that attack God's word. Where did God come from? How do you know the Bible is true? What about millions of years? What about carbon dating? How do you explain the race of people? How, how, how do you deal with the gay marriage issue? What, 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 do you do with, what, what do you do with abortion? How do we understand that? How, what, what do we do with, with the Big Bang? And, and wait a minute, where did Cain get his wife? And what about the flood? And how do we understand all this? Because they're, they're the questions you hear today that most of us have not taught our kids how to answer. Most in the church haven't. And in fact, the majority of our Christian institutions and churches are telling kids, don't worry about that. You can believe whatever the world believes. Trust in Jesus. Don't get me wrong. We want them to trust in Jesus. But we want them to listen to the message. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Apologetics teaching has been missing from much of the church. Praise the Lord, we're seeing more and more churches. Over 10,000 have been using Answers in Genesis Bible curriculum. Thousands are using the Answers in Genesis BBS. And the books and the DVDs and millions are coming to our website. And we're starting to see more and more churches and Christian leaders realize the importance of teaching apologetics. But there's another aspect that is so important that I think is missing from much of our church. Teaching generations to think foundationally. What do I mean by that? Today, if you say you don't agree with abortion, you'll be called a misogynist. If you say that marriage is a man and a woman, you'll be called homophobic. If you say gender is male and female because God created that way and biologically, which is true, that's how it is, You'll be called transphobic. If you're a person like me, with light skin who's a male, you're a racist. That's, that's where our culture's at. You see, the problem is, I believe, that we have not raised generations to understand the foundation of God's word. It's a revelation from him. It's a history book. It's not just a book of spiritual things and moral things. It's a history book, and that history is foundational to the walls and the roof. We need to help them understand that to have a truly Christian worldview, you need to know what you believe, why you believe what you do, and you need to know the foundation of your worldview, and you need to know why those who are against God's word think the way they do, so you will know how to talk with them. And you know, that's what we really do at the Ark and the Creation Museum. We're well known for the seven seas of history at the Creation Museum. We'll walk through Genesis 1 to 11, the geological, biological, astronomical, anthropological history, the first four C's, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, that's foundational to the gospel, foundational to all of our doctrines. 
And you see, the, the reason we do that, let, let me explain to you. What, what we're doing is we're helping people understand that history, uh, corruption, death came because of sin. That's why there's death in the world. There was a global flood. That's why you find fossils all over the world. God made Adam and Eve. That's why marriage is a man and a woman. God made man in the image of God. That's why abortion is murder. You see, I've had people come to me, I've had someone come to me at a conference and say, I'm a homosexual, what are you going to do about that? I'm not going to take my Christian worldview and try to impose that on that person, which is what some Christians try to do, because I recognize if they don't have the same foundation I do, they're not going to understand my worldview. So I have to explain to them, in fact, I've had them say to me things like, so, okay, so... Um, I, I believe in gay marriage. What's your answer to that? And I said, well, let me explain why I believe what I do. I start with the Bible. I don't believe the Bible. You don't believe the Bible? No. Now, you know what you'll be told by a lot of people today? I just saw this with Matt Walsh, for instance, if any of you are familiar with him. And uh, he's telling people, if somebody says they don't believe the Bible, you can't start with the Bible. Question, if you don't start with the Bible, there's only one other foundation. What is it? Man's word. You lost the battle. But you see, I understand those people don't believe the Bible. You know what I say? You don't believe the Bible? Guess what? I do. Now, you got a problem with that? Tell me what your problems are. Ask me your questions. I want to answer them because I want to point you to the fact that this really is the true history of the world, and it really is God's Word. And they'll ask questions about carbon dating and ape men. I do my best to answer them. There comes a time when I say, look, I've answered to the best of my ability. I want you to understand, because I start here, that's why my worldview is the way it is. If you don't have the same starting point as me, you're not going to have the same worldview. Understand, I don't hate you because of that. Not at all. I love you because I want you to understand. And we're told as Christians to love our neighbors. But what I find is when my worldview disagrees with them, ultimately they accuse me of hate. You see, the very first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning God created. The molecule of life, DNA, couldn't come about by chance random processes because it's a language system and an information system. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him. Male and female, he created them. By the way, if you believe the Bible start with that foundation, there's male and female. So there's the gender issue solved. But if you don't believe the Bible is the absolute authority, I get it, you're not going to have the same worldview as me. God created man in his own image. Here's a fertilized human egg at the first cleavage stage, the first division stage. I put that there for a reason. You get one set of DNA from the mother, one from the mother, father. There's a unique combination of information, different to the father, different to the mother. It's a unique individual made in the image of God. No new information is added, which means what's the difference between a fertilized egg or when you can hear a heartbeat or six months, seven months, nine months, or after birth, there is no difference. It is the same individual made in the image of God. And abortion is murder. <laughs> if you don't believe the Bible as I do, as your foundation, I get it. You believe man's just an animal? Well, you're just getting rid of an animal. I understand. You have a different worldview. Bible says God made man from dust. He brought the man... He brought the animals to the man to name to show that he was all alone. There was none that looked like him. And so he put him to sleep. I mean, he didn't look at a female chimp and say, you know, she's close enough, I could date her. <laughs> and God put him to sleep and from his side made the first woman and brought her to the man and the first recorded words of Adam, she's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man, which you read in the New Testament quoted twice in 1 Corinthians 11, for instance. And then the very next verse says, therefore, this is the reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they'll be one flesh. In other words, this is the reason for marriage. But understand something. If you've been told by your Christian college, like Wheaton, that there wasn't a real Adam and wasn't a real Eve, not a literal Adam, literal Eve, wasn't literally made from dust, woman not literally made from his side, then there's no foundation for marriage. It's whatever you want to make it to be, which is why they would support whatever. When Jesus, who's the God-man, was asked about marriage, in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, it's recorded, he answered, haven't you read the authority of the word? Haven't you read he which made the beginning made the male and female? 
Genesis 1.27, and said, Therefore shall a man cleave unto his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they'll be one flesh. Haven't you read the history in Genesis? It's foundational to the doctrine of marriage. God invented marriage. God ordained marriage. There is no such thing as same-sex marriage because marriage is an ordained institution by God. Same-sex union or whatever you want to call it, but not marriage. We know it's a man and a woman. But if you don't believe Genesis as history and you don't believe the Bible is your foundation, I get it, you can have a whole, whole different worldview. You say marriage is whatever you want to make it to be. Do you realize all of our doctrines are founded in Genesis? Every single one of them? See, if you want to teach kids, want to teach coming generations or others, you want to witness to them, why do we believe what we do? Because we start with this foundation. And because Genesis is true. But you don't have that, then anything goes, which is what we're seeing happening in the culture and much of the church. And you know, you think about it, the church compromised in all sorts of areas. Oh, we'll take evolution. Oh, we'll take millions of years out in the Bible. Oh, we'll take, um, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll take the Big Bang and add it in the Bible. Oh, gay marriage. Well, yeah, we can, we can change marriage. Because once you unlock that door that you can start outside of Scripture and you can start with what the world is saying, and now, what, now you, you know what you're seeing? The church is trying to adopt the ways of the world in all sorts of areas to try to attract people in because they didn't give them the right foundation, didn't give them the answers, and didn't stand boldly without compromise on the Word of God. And now the church looks much like the world, much of the church. The Bible says that when God created everything, it was very good. After he created man. The Bible makes it clear death is an enemy. That's what it says. Death is an enemy. It wasn't always here. If you believe in millions of years, like those professors at Wheaton, death's always been here. God used death to bring things into being. The Bible says, no, death is the penalty for sin. In fact, the first death was when God killed animals and clothed Adam and Eve. There's the origin of clothing. That's why we wear clothes. There's a court case right now because a teacher, a woman teacher sent a picture of herself topless to a male teacher and it got it, students got it and all the rest of it. And so she got fired and now she's taking them to court because she said, men have pictures of themselves shirtless. You are discriminating uh, against my gender. This is gender discrimination. See, ultimately, once you abandon the absolute authority, people, anything goes. And in a sense, I would say, don't get me wrong when I say this, please don't get me wrong. She's actually being right for calling them to be consistent with their foundation. But it's the wrong foundation. God gave clothes because of sin. The first blood sacrifices are covering for their sin. A picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. The life of the flesh is in the blood. If there was a shedding of blood millions of years before Adam sinned, what has the shedding of blood got to do with the remission of sins? And if this wasn't a literal event, then tell me, why do we wear clothes? Why not take them off? Which more and more people are doing to one degree or another. The Bible says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sin. We're not related to the animals. We, we're not in the ape family. A man brought sin and death in the world, so a man would need to pay the penalty for sin. But it can't be any one of us because we're sinners. It had to be a perfect man. Adam was perfect before he sinned. But it needs to be one of us because we're all one human family, so God steps into history to be the member of the human family as the God-man, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, and offers a free gift of salvation. But if you believe in millions of years, like the majority of our Christian college professors, you know, in the fossil record, there's evidence of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs. The Bible says originally they were vegetarian, and the animals are vegetarian. I watched some of the videos this week. You know how they get around that? Well, it doesn't say they didn't eat meat. Oh, it, it does, yeah, in other words, it does, doesn't say that. It just says that they ate plants. Well, then in Genesis 9, 3, after the flood, God says to Noah, just as I gave you the plants, which means verse 29 was emphasizing that's vegetarian, and verse 30 is written the same way. Just as I gave you the plants, now I give you all things. How do they get around that? Well, that's only to humans. That wasn't to the animals. See, it doesn't matter what you say, they're going to twist the Scriptures. Scripture says that. If you believe in millions of years, you know what's in the fossil record? Diseases. Diseases like cancer 
and so on. And arthritis, you know, Genesis 131 says, after God made everything, it was very good. If you believe in millions of years, then God called cancer very good. How do they get around that? Well, good doesn't mean perfect. That's how they get around that. See, these two things can't be true at the same time. There's not millions of years of fossils. Most of it's the graveyard of the flood. And then after the flood, we have an event where as people build up on the earth, God gave different languages. And so as a result, different people groups formed, not different races. We're all one race. Even the Human Genome Project, when they mapped the human genome, said, guess what we found? There's only one race. The church should have been out there saying, of course there's only one race. People, here's what I want to say to you. Look, when you think about it very, very carefully, that history in the seven seas, that history there, when you take that history as written and it's the foundation for your thinking, then we know what to believe about race. We know there's only one race. We know racism is wrong. We know we're all equal before God. We know we're all sinners. We know we all need salvation. We understand why there are fossils all over the world. We know why there's death and suffering. It's our fault. It's not God's fault because we sinned against a holy God. We know why marriage is a man and a woman. We know why abortion is wrong. But you know what? Much of the church has neglected that history, said it's not true, doesn't matter. Even conservative churches won't teach it, teach the spiritual and moral things, and our kids have been given a different foundation. Now they have a different worldview, and we're losing them from the church and losing the culture. And the bottom line is two foundations, two different worldviews. But what we're seeing is the collapse of Christian morality and increasing moral relativism because there's been a change foundationally. And the change foundationally is that generations, even from the church, have been told to build their thinking on man's word, not God's word. The Philistines have stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And Abraham and Isaac dug again the wells of water. And again, I want to challenge us. We need to use what we learn at this conference, what we learn at the Ark Encounter, what we learn from the books and the resources to dig again the wells of water so the water of the word will flow freely across the land because the most important message in the entire universe is that God's word is true and the message of the gospel in this word is true. And my heart in all of this, my heart is not to go out there and attack Christian colleges. My heart is not to go out and, and to attack people. I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. When I was quoting some of those people, I'm just, I'm just quoting what they said. I'm quoting what they said. I'm not attacking them personally. I'm not saying they're not a Christian. I could, quote, I could quote some great men of God and some of their video clips to you. You'd probably be staggered. People like John Piper, who believes in billions of years and that Genesis 1 is not telling us what's made on each day. It's sort of a picture story. I, I, I could quote all sorts of other people from different colleges, and Calvin College and many other colleges, and even, even many of the conservative colleges. Oh, I quoted from a conservative college. I want you to understand, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get across to us, and, and, and if I could get some of these people and, and <laughs> shake them by the neck, don't you get it? Look, you, you, you're undermining the authority of the word. Do you realize what you're doing to the younger generations? Do you realize what you're doing to the church? I, I know you love the Lord, I know you're preaching the gospel, but look, it's an authority issue. So I pray we can get that across to the church and to pastors, to Christian leaders, to Sunday school teachers, to parents, 